It is now 5.30 p.m. and I now call to order the Grand Island Public Schools Board of Education meeting. This is the February 8th, 2024 meeting. Notice of this meeting has been advertised in the Grand Island Independent, which is the district's designated method of giving notice of these meetings. We want those in attendance to know that copies of the Open Meetings Act are available at the entrance to the boardroom. If anyone in attendance is interested in addressing our board, you are welcome to do so. We simply request that you complete the appropriate form and turn it into us so that you may be recognized during the request to address the board part of our meeting. If you have not already completed the form, please see the staff person outside the entrance to this room. Public comment is welcome. We do ask that no signs be brought into the boardroom. Mrs. Dibbert, would you please call the roll? Mr. McFarland. Present. Mr. Hawley. Here. Mr. Garcia Mendez. Present. Mrs. Albers. Here. Mr. Sykes. Here. Ms. Modlin. Here. Mr. Helinski. Here. Mrs. Wilson. Here. Mrs. Jurgens gave prior notice that she will be excused from today's meeting. Thank you, Mrs. Dibbert. The first item on the agenda tonight is the consent agenda. The con consent agenda is to be approved as follows. Items number 3.1 through 3.8. At this time, I would uh, entertain a motion to approve the consent agenda as published. I make a motion to approve the consent agenda as submitted. Second. Second by Mr. Garcia Mendez. Does anyone have a potential conflict of interest on agenda item 3.3? If so, please state the check number that you'll be abstaining from voting on. Seeing none, discussion, none, we proceed to a vote. Motion passes. Item number four, request to address the board. And we do not have any, I do not believe we have any this evening. I'll go ahead and read the rationale. Each person's re addressing the board are allowed five minutes. The Board of Education has a prerogative to limit speaking to three minutes when there are three or more patrons to allow speakers an opportunity to address the board in a timely manner. We allocate up to 30 minutes for addressing the board at each regular board meeting. Please face the board, not the, the audience when you speak. We want to hear as being said, so we ask the audience to refrain from making comments or sounds that make it hard to hear the speaker. No signs are allowed in the boardroom. We will not engage in dialogue with patrons presenting to the board. The purpose of the request to address the board is to listen to patrons. Board president and superintendent will identify staff to follow up on information requested from patrons when necessary. At regular business meetings, any school district related matter can be presented to the board but only agenda items can be acted upon during a given meeting. At special meetings, comments will be limited to the subject of action items of the meeting's agenda. Speakers will not be permitted to make defamatory comments or use abusive or vulgar language. Expressions of personal complaints about staff or students are discouraged at public meetings. Concerns about individuals should be brought to the attention of the appropriate administrative authority. Specific building or program concerns should be brought to the attention of the building principal or program supervisor. And once again, we do not have anyone ad addressing the board this evening. Item number five, information items. Update on EL and newcomer programming in Grand Island Public Schools. Dr. Amanda Libos. Hello everyone, my name is Dr. Amanda Libas and I'm the English Learner Director and Equity Systems Navigator for Grand Public Schools. I'm super excited uh, to be able to provide you an update just on our uh, Grand Island Public Schools EL program and also the growth that we um, saw last year and are currently seeing uh, the school year. Um, I couldn't do the things that I do without an amazing staff. We currently have 52 EL teachers. Um, elementary through high school uh, that are dedicated to work with our English learners. Um, and uh, what's unique to Grand Island as well when I talk to other school districts is we have amazing support staff, including someone like me in a role as an EL coordinator, director of the program, a welcome center with a coordinator and family liaison, 
and then instructional um, EL instruction and curriculum uh, support specialists to work with our elementary and middle school and high school teachers. And then recently, last year, we added an immigrant family liaison to help with all of our recently arrived immigrant students who have come to our district. Um, to brag on our teachers a little bit, um, you don't have to have an ESL endorsement to um, be an EL teacher, but 42 of our uh, teachers have ESL endorsements. 26 have been letters trained, which uh, if you remember, you probably heard a lot of that from Dr. Bittany Bills when she was here. Um, 16 and probably more of our teachers are multilingual. And we have over 30 bilingual paraprofessionals that work within our district, um, mostly Spanish, English speaking uh, paraprofessionals. So in Grand Island Public Schools, we currently have 26% of our students are in the English Learner Program. And you can see the breakdown that the majority of our students are at the elementary level. Of that, over 66% of the elementary ELs are born in the United States. Um, so you, um, their needs are very different um, than maybe some of the needs of our students coming in K-12 that are um, coming from out of country. And then we also have uh, 747 students who have recently exited the EL program because they have shown proficiency on our Alpha 21 screener or Alpha 21 summative assessment which I'll talk about here in a little bit. And we are required by federal and state guidelines to monitor their progress for four years, even after they're out of the program. So I'm not gonna ask you to unmute and ask, but just think in your head. I get a lot of questions about our diversity and there's more to our diversity than uh, birth country and language, but I'm just gonna present these two facts to you. Um, if you had to guess how many birth countries are represented in GIPS, can I think of that number? And the number is 56 currently. Our top five countries, of course, are the United States. And then majority of our students currently are coming from Cuba, Guatemala, um, Mexico, and El Salvador, and then other Central American countries. If you think about home languages, we have the 56 countries. We then also have 55 home languages represented in uh, Grand Island Public Schools. Um, so besides English, our students speak Spanish, Arabic, Somali, and then multiple languages from Guatemala, um, and Vietnamese and New are our top five languages spoken within Grand Island Public Schools. One um, thing that I'd like to add, um, I don't know <laughs> if most people can say there was anything that good, what good came out of the pandemic, um, but because of the pandemic, and then also with the, um, in April of 2021, I believe, when we had the Afghan refugees come in, we were able to secure uh, Tarjimli, which is a on-demand phone line for all of the languages that our family speaks. So that has been a game changer for a lot of our schools when we don't have community members or others who speak the languages that our parents um, and guardians come to us with. Um, so why Grand Island? Well, this is one of the questions that we ask our families when they come to the Welcome Center. Um, as you can guess, a lot is work-related or being reunited with families, but one that we should be really proud of is welcoming school community is one of the reasons why families choose Grand Island over other places that they could um, uh, live. Um, we are also seeing uh, the effects of the humanitarian parolee program and um, migrants and asylees uh, and refugees from countries. And so we have currently um, countries represented from those different areas as well. So we are required to have obviously a language instruction program for our English learners and migrant students. And the purpose is threefold. We want our students to attain English proficiency we want them to meet grade level academic standards, and we also want to engage parents and families who may be new to the US school system. One uh, really awesome thing that our school district did way back in 2007 was establish a welcome center. Um, and we moved the welcome center in 2021 to the Career Pathways Institute. Uh, this is one thing that if we did not have the welcome center, I don't know that we would have successfully like, um, we would have successfully done it, but we all of our schools and secretaries would have had to play a major role in welcoming our new families. And here we have a centralized location uh, where we can have families come, register for school, get all the assessments that need to be taken, and then the community partnerships um, for our families who are new to the community. Um, we can make those connections to them. So if you haven't been to the Welcome Center, uh, reach out to me. We can definitely um, have you go visit. Melinda Sturgill is our coordinator over there, and Gabby Gonzalez is our family liaison. They are busy. 
um, welcoming new families um, every single day. And this is also a destination um, for other school districts. Um, Lexington Public Schools is coming in a couple of weeks because they don't have a welcome center. It's definitely something that they want to um, investigate uh, doing. So I said they were busy. They have been busy since August of 2023. Each week, we've averaged 14 to 22 new students who have been enrolled through our Welcome Center. It's not been a day or a week that they not had new families walk through our door. So we're definitely living up to our name of a welcoming center um, uh, for Grand Island Public Schools. Again, these are only families who speak a language other than English that are coming through our doors. This does not include families who are English-speaking families that enroll in school. So who are English learners? Home language is something other than English, and they have yet to demonstrate English proficiency on the Alpha 21 assessment. State guidelines that we have one assessment that they have to show proficiency on. Um, so as you can see, our enrollment number, or our new students that have gone through the Welcome Center have gradually increased uh, since 2018, 2019, when we have kind of some formal data um, collected, and we've already surpassed our numbers from the 22-23 school year um, with 25 more students that have already enrolled um, through the Welcome Center. We've had 100 since December 31st of 2023, so we've already seen 100 new students in uh, 2024. So sometimes I, there's a lot of confusion between ELs and newcomers. Um, sometimes they're the same, sometimes they're different. So in Grand Island Public Schools, we consider newcomer students or students who would benefit from our newcomer prog programming to be new to the US, so they've only been here for less than one year. Um, their home language, of course, is something other than English. They have a um, screener score of proficiency not demonstrated or emerging and they have limited or interrupted formal education experiences. So we have students that are coming to us from Central America, um, middle school, high school, that maybe the last time they were in school was in third or fourth grade. Um, just the realities of, of their lived experiences of where they're coming from. So our newcomer programs, um, you can see just the increase of numbers. Um, we have two five newcomers. The, the grade two five newcomer program has been in existence since 2006. We had two teachers, they were housed at Gates. If you remember in 2011, we went to the continuous school year. And so we moved our newcomer program to Westlawn because our students would benefit from having um, that opportunity of year round school. Um, and we increased to three teachers and then um, you probably remember me coming to the board last year. We did the transition to Stolly Park. We're full transition to Stolly Park. We have five teachers currently um, at Stolly Park working with our newcomer program. You can see that we are already over 35 more students in our 2-5 newcomer program than we were last year that are new uh, to Grand Island. Uh, most noticeably has been our middle school. Um, we've seen 54 more students enroll in middle school this school year than we did last year. Um, Bar significant. Lee has seen an increase compared to past years, and I'll kind of talk to you about how we've responded to the needs um, to the schools here at, towards the end. Um, and then our high school program, uh, we have seen six more students than we have last year, but we're on that study increase as well. So our, our multilingual learners are coming with wide ver variabilities. Um, so we have lots of different ages. We have students with um, various language backgrounds, language development, literacy skills in their first language and their second language. We have students, there's a lot of commonalities between English and their first language, and there we have languages that are a lot of differences um, between them. Um, we also are seeing more students with special education needs already identified um, before enrolling in school than we have seen in previous years. And then we also have to take into consideration just the needs are different for our students who are born in the US versus our students who are foreign born. So we have a continuum of services, which I'm super proud um, that we are able to offer all of these things, because again, not every school district has this level of supports um, and services for our English learners. So like I said, we have our newcomer program, which is a full day program really tailored to our students who are new to the US. Um, we have then pull out um, and targeted support 
uh, services for our students once they transition out of newcomers um, at the high school. Really proud to be able to offer sheltered instruction classes, which means that our teachers are endorsed both in the content and in EL, so our students are earning core credit uh, for those classes um, before they're even proficient in the English language. And then some of our students don't need the pull-out services and we provide opportunities in class supports or EL support. So some co-teaching that's happening um, at the elementary level, some of it through the PLC in collaboration with the EL teacher and, and our instructional resources with the EL supports embedded within it. And then like I said before, we have the four years of monitoring for the students have exited our program. Um, I'm on several state and national committees. I'm constantly asking, what are you doing? How are you doing it? What can we do better? Um, and we also have lots of districts contacting us to come and see newcomers programming. Um, I just had, I've had so many calls this semester, but Omaha Metro schools who wanna start secondary newcomer programs because they're getting an increase in middle school, high school students that are EELs and they don't have a newcomer program. Um, I had a district in Iowa contact me that heard about <laughs> Grant Dylan and us um, to kind of work through kind of some problem solving, same issues that we're having uh, that we can work together on. And then, like I said, currently Lexington's gonna come for a visit here soon. Um, we are in the process right now of giving the ELPA 21 assessment. So our teachers are busy assessing students. And then, like I said, this is the one assessment for students to score proficient on to formally exit our program. We give it for a few reasons. Placement, so identifies a student as EL, what kind of services they wish to receive, shows their progress over time in reading, writing, speaking, and listening. It's also the reclassification, so exiting, and then it also is our accountability system um, and on-track status for AQUEST. And so we, um, again, it's one point in time, of scores, but it does inform a lot of the decisions that we make, um, both at the individual student level, classroom level, school level, and the district level. Um, students get, it's, I've been over at the high school for three days, and I had a really long conversation with a senior about why do I have to take this again? Been in EL since elementary school, and he was, uh, great conversation and he's like, okay, I'll do it. <laughs> I'm like, good, because otherwise <laughs> um, we'd be having a conversation with your family, but um, they take four different tests. I think this is the only test that students take that has a speaking component. So it's very different for students, right? To have to speak into a microphone to a computer that's not talking back to you. Um, they get a score on each test, one through five, one being beginning, five being advanced. Um, and then they are given an overall score of this emerging, progressing, and proficient, which all of our teachers have access to that information um, right away to see kind of like, where does my student fall in this and when did they start EL? Because of AQUEST, again, I was probably the only person who was happy about AQUEST, um, because finally we had a measure or a matrix on like how long do our students, uh, like what should we expect for students from year to year? As a former EL newcomer teacher at the high school, I felt a lot of pressure to get students proficient in a year. Well, we know it takes five to seven years to learn academic language, then what does it mean for ELPA 21? So with this progress towards the EL proficiency chart, it allows students six years to get to that proficiency level, and it shows what does it mean to be on track um, on that, and then when um, our students are off track, what we should be looking at. Um, this is super overwhelming, but I want to, th couple things that I want to point out on this. One, we are currently testing 369 more students and growing than we tested last year. 66% um, of our students fall in the progressing range. So we're like right in the middle of where um, students are. You would think like, oh, we have all these newcomers. They're, they're limited in English. That's not true. They're at that progressing um, area. Um, we have some celebrations from last year. We had, I know it's a small percentage, 0.19% more proficient. But when you think about that, we had 211 students who scored proficient, and that was 30 more than we had the year before. So our teachers are doing some really good things. We also had 2.3% um, more students on track 
um, than the year before, and we are rocking it at first and third grade. So I think it's a combination of what we're doing tier one, what we've um, done with like letters training and the foundational skills things, because students learn to read the same. There's just things that need to be amplified for an English learner or someone who speaks a language other than English. Um, and then what we're doing in our pullout um, and newcomer services. So how have we been responding to growing needs? I started last year. Um, we added, in elementary, we added two newcomer teachers in February. We transitioned all of the, the program to Stolly Park, and we added some district support for bilingual um, support over at Stolly in the office. And then we did all staff, we've done this for several years, all elementary staff ELPD, professional learning, um, choice sessions. So like if you've been here and a teacher in Grand Island Public Schools for 20 years, there was a session for you and there was a session for if you're brand new to this EL, EL world. In the middle school, we filled um, two of our FTEs um, that, were current, that were being filled by our EL coach. And so that really helped us with this coming school year to have those positions filled. And then at the high school, we did the grade placement change. Um, we added a newcomer teacher in January, and then um, collaboration with principals. They were on my list of support staff, but I have great relationships with principals, L4L members, academic support uh, coaches, just on thinking differently. And so we thought differently at the high school and designed a 19 plus program with an additional teacher because we had 19 year olds who were dropping out last year. That program started with 12, and we have uh, we've only had one student drop out. So like, I know it's a small program, but it's made a huge difference um, for that group of students who their path to graduation um, is gonna be very different than a student coming to us at 14. Um, and then we moved to Wyandotte, which has been um, successful for that half day, because we have an on-site counselor every day, we have an immigrant liaison, and then we also have partnership with Wayne um, College. Wayne State College has somebody there once or twice a week to work with our students as well. So it's just been kind of an awesome, awesome thing. We've been growing through the year. So what have we done through the year? At the elementary level, we made sure that we had the five bilingual pairs filled at the at two five newcomers. Um, the pay raise has helped that tremendously. I was begging years before for former students to come back and work for me on Facebook, um, but we've been able to fill all of our positions. Um, in January of 2024, we reassigned a .5 FTE from Jefferson, EL Jefferson, to Stolly Park to help with our growing numbers. Um, continue to do professional learning and we've done ELPD um, requested at different sites. So we've done some stuff at Wasmer, uh, I can anchor them and I can't even keep track anymore of everywhere that we get requests for. At the middle school level, we added a newcomer teacher to BAR um, October 2023. So they went from two teachers to three teachers. Um, and we, I'm doing an all staff ELPD for them tomorrow. And then Westridge, the decision um, was made with uh, Kayla Wickman that they're gonna start serving newcomer students um, in January 2024. Because currently, we any Westridge students were being, um, were attending either Bar or Walnut, but with Bar and Walnut numbers continuing to grow, um, we had to make a decision um, to start serving there. So they have a full-time teacher there. We were able to add a bilingual para there to help support it's just gonna be the future needs of, of that growing, what that's gonna look like. And I did an all staff ELPD there in January. The high school, I worked with Mr. Wickman um, and counselors, Mr. Hubbard here too, on just the credit process. So what is our process for honoring credits for students who are coming from countries that were in high school um, to get them um, on their path to graduation. Um, basically, we planned a mini conference for them in November where we did uh, choice sessions for all the high school staff um, around EL and different strategies. And then I'm um, super excited working with Nikki Stoltenberg next week at parent teacher conferences. We're going to hold those at Wyandotte and we're going to have a bunch of nonprofit organizations there to, to um, interact and, and work with our families that are newcomers that um, have been here for maybe a day or have been here for over a year. So what's keeping me up at night and our team and our EL teachers, obviously enrollment numbers and staffing, our two five newcomers classes, we have class sections that are approaching, uh, that are over 25 approaching 30 um, at all levels, um, K-12. We have some transitioning that'll be happening after parent teacher conferences that'll help a little bit. But as you saw, we have already surpassed our January numbers from last year. So I can only see or predict um, 
increased numbers continuing to move forward. I definitely, um, we need to fill that 612 EL curriculum instruction or coaching role. I've been taking on a lot of that. Um, my priority was teachers in classrooms, so I held off on filling that position for the school year because I'd rather have teachers in classrooms. Um, but we are seeing a need to help explore teachers, elective teachers, um, just working with newcomers and students that um, maybe are new to them um, in the past. Um, our EL programming needs, we're constantly looking at how we're supporting students as they transition out of a full day newcomer program into their home schools or into a different level of services. I need to, we need to be thinking about year two of this 19 plus program because if kids are returning, we can't just do the same thing over again. So what's that gonna look like for them? Um, and then just continuing to evaluate um, our services and professional learning, um, obviously continue training and support we're doing lots of very uh, niche things for schools as they need them. Um, we can always do more. And then just supporting our EL teachers because their role is expanding. They're not just teaching EL students in the classroom, they're also uh, contributing members of the PLC. Um, I'm trying to get them to do more training instead of uh, me and Stephanie doing all that. So we're doing a lot of collaborating or co-facilitating of the training at their schools and then also having them to, uh, do all the data analysis. Um, so I'm gonna leave you with this quote. I'm not gonna try and pronounce it, but it's an Afghan proverb in Dari. Um, that literally means drop by drop, drop river becomes every little thing that we're doing counts. And I know that we have a lot more to do and a lot more that we can support with our newcomers, but I feel like we're headed in the right direction and I need all the um, outside of the ideas because um, I'm asking the questions and everyone's like, oh, that's a good question. We're thinking about that. Who we don't have the answer for you either. So with that, I'll open it up for questions. Ms. Salvers. First of all, just thank you. Thank you for what you do. Thank you for what your staff does. Um, I love it when you come and present. I love visiting with you about the amazing things that you're doing at GIPS and we are just so proud of um, what we're able to offer students and I was hoping that you wouldn't mind sharing your slides. I would certainly like them and I, don't, I think other people on the board might like them too because these are questions we get asked a lot. It would be really nice to have this information at our fingertips but just well done. And so after I review the slides, I'll probably email you some questions. <laughs> so, but yeah, I've already shared them with Angela. I was okay. making some last minute changes just right. up to okay. this morning. Thank you so yes. much. Mr. Hawley. Thanks, Dr. Levos, for coming. I have two questions for you. Um, you were talking about class sections that are approaching 30. How many pairs do you have on average to support each teacher in those sections? So in the 2-5 newcomer program, it's one-to-one. -one. It's one-to-one. -one. Um, at the middle school level, I believe it's one-to-one. -one. Okay. Um, at the high school, we only have two for the six classrooms. We also have two of our high school teachers that are bilingual. Not that that doesn't, I mean, there's just more bodies, so. Um, just because they're bilingual doesn't mean they couldn't use the support, but. Sure, sure. Yeah. And my other question, you were talking about how we need to support students four years after they come out of the program, correct? How does that work with graduating students? Are we, are we working with them after graduation? Maybe they come here as a sophomore or a junior. Does that four-year thing end when they graduate? Yes. Okay. Yeah, we don't. Yeah, there's no um, protocol or process for um, supporting students after they graduate. Um, most of our monitoring, it used to be very entailed for our teachers and because of our um, MTSS process and PLCs, it's more happening within that than on the shoulders of our EL teachers because that would skyrocket their caseloads if they had to um, do all that on their own, but they're there to support. And I also am super proud. We have an EL teacher at every single one of our campuses, which that helps too, that all of our teachers have access to somebody. And if they don't know the answers, they have Stephanie Frankfurt, our EL coach, myself, and Melinda Sturgill to come to for, for support. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Mr. Garcia Mendez. Thank you. Um, so I think I have two questions. Um, the f <laughs> Maybe, uh, but uh, thank you again for being here. Uh, one question is, um, are any pairs kind of like in the process right now of becoming 
EL teachers or any of them that express interest or yes. what does that look like? Yes, but I don't know on the top of my head how many. Yeah. But we have one, two five newcomers, we have one. Mm -hmm. He also won the award last year because he was running the two five show by himself. So the foundation award for um, awesome. paraprofessionals. Um, and then I've had others that have expressed interest. Yeah. yeah. No, that sounds awesome. Thank you. Um, the other one is when you were talking about how they have to take the four different tests, yeah. can you explain that a little bit more, how if they test out of, say, three of those and they don't test out of one, do they have to take all of those tests again or they don't have to take those three again? Great question. Had that conversation with my senior, the senior today. Yeah. <laughs> uh, they have to take all four again. So. Yeah. Um, that's unfortunate, uh, just the rule that um, is in place right now at the state level. Uh, so they, what we see is a lot of students are proficient in speaking, listening, and then it's either reading or writing that they're like one level away from being proficient. Um, there is conversations, because I'm on that national group um, at state level, about like banking. Could we bank that at the high school level so they wouldn't have to come back and do all four? Um, but right now, it's kind of it's a civil rights um, conversation um, for our students, and so uh, yeah, the test um, it's on average for a high school student could take anywhere from an hour and a half to three hours. It just depends on like how dedicated they are, you know, to taking each of the assessments. All right, thank you, Mr. Holly. Another question. We talked about the amount of students that we're seeing, the, the influx, and obviously this year we've blown away last year's numbers already. Um, and I can't imagine it's easy to forecast what that's going to look like for the rest of the year. Is there any national data that we can get or that, you, that you've seen that would give us an indication of what we're looking at going through the end of this year and then into next year? No, the only like advice I've been given by some local leaders in the, that work with immigrant um, uh, students and families is to look at what you did last year and expect that or more until there's you know possible changes in policy politically um, we're going to continue to see we'll always continue to see families coming to Grand Island just because of our services in our community um, but just the um, increase of numbers you can tell that it's related to some of the humanitarian parolee things and um, some of the refugee and asylee um. sounds like a very exact formula Right on. Uh, yeah. <laughs> I asked that question and I asked, is there an equity formula on how many EL teachers you should have? Because all of our students are so individual that I can't say we need this many teachers because our students who are almost proficient really, they don't need that pull out service time, but our newcomers need lots um, of support. So. All right. Well, thank you, Dr. Levos. Appreciate it. Thank yes. You. Okay, item number 5.2, Hope Squad at Grand Island Senior High, Dr. Dexter. Okay. So we're here tonight. Uh, about a year ago, we had Dr. Hudnall present to the board on Hope Squad. He's the um, researcher, the implementer. The, he continues to monitor across the United States the different Hope Squads that um, high schools have. It, it, Hope Squad can be K through 12, and we chose to start with the high school, and that was based on data that our counselors and um, social workers collect on the number of students who um, threaten suicide, talk about suicide, that suicide ideation. Um, we have an awesome team who has put together a suicide screener. We work closely with our area agencies, and so we, last year at this time, we had 266 suicide ideations. Um, we had 40-some hospitalizations. Um, the year before that was even higher. Um, so we just talked to, with uh, with us, and then we went. I went to a conference and listened to Dr. Hudnall on the Hope Squad that kids will know before adults when a student's struggling. And so if we can teach kids on when they hear something, see something, um, what's our next step, who can they go to, what are the signs they recognize. And so that's why we implemented Hope Squad. 
and um, Mr. Schultz is going to talk about um, that process. And the one thing that caught me when Dr. Hudnall presented, he said, you students pick the representatives from the classroom. And I thought, well, how do they do that? Simple survey of um, who would you go to out of your class? And he said, a small number will rise to the surface. And I thought, well, but um, I think Matt will talk to you a little bit about how that happened. Um, kids know who to talk to, who to rely on, and, um, and that's how we identified the kids for Hope Squad. But they'll go into that more detail. So we will get this going. Take it away. Thank you, Dr. Exeter. Good evening. Um, with me is Kobe Callahan. Uh, Kobe is a member of our Hope Squad. Uh, we hope to have uh, several more here, but we got hit by the sickness bug uh, the last couple of days. So we had four or five that wanted to be here, but they emailed me this morning and let me know that they were at home with strep throat. So Kobe's a trooper, so he's here. Um, how it started off, if you look up here, these are our advisors. We have 15 total advisors uh, that are in Hope Squad. Three of our advisors are what we call floating advisors. That would include Dr. DeFrank. Uh, Dr. Dexter and then Mr. Hubbard as well. The rest of the advisors are all teachers, uh, support personnel, uh, counselors, uh, and um, uh, I can't, the paras uh, as well. That uh, were asked if anybody had an interest. Uh, they came back. We ended up going with three people per grade level. Uh, so we have split up our members of the Hope Squad into freshmen, sophomore, junior, and seniors, and then three advisors meet uh, with each one of those grade levels. What we have here uh, is I just kind of walk you through a timeline of how everything has kind of gone down. In June of 23, uh, we met with Kevin Rolfs from Bellevue West uh, at a training over at CPI. We were there for all day. Uh, every advisor was there, got introduced to what Hope Squad is, the program, the platform. Uh, and kind of how it uh, moves along. In August of 23, uh, the advisors met once we came back and started to talk about the selection process. Uh, and we kind of had the same uh, gut feeling that Dr. Dexter did when they said just trust the kids, uh, that you'll, you'll start to see this data that shows that the kids know what they need. And uh, we were kind of skeptical, so we decided how we wanted to roll that out. In early September, we rolled out the Hope Squad to the rest of the staff up at Senior High, uh, where we let them know of what was going to take place. And then in mid to late September, we started to introduce the Hope Squad, what it was, to the student body. Uh, we did that in our English classes, where we sent out a one-page flyer that kind of introduced what Hope Squad was, what the ideals of Hope Squad were, and then we started to ask the kids to think about who fits the parameters of what the Hope Squad is looking for. Once we did the initial rollout in the early part of October, we collected over 1,100 responses to the survey from all high school kids. We asked the high school students to produce anywhere between one and three names we had a massive amount of data to sift through. Uh, and it took us a while to sift through it, uh, trying to collect names, trying to figure out uh, how many they uh, were looking at, did they get the correct grade level, uh, and multiple names, who it was, and so forth. So it took us a little while to get through that. Finally, in late October, we had our data set uh, available in front of us that included well over 700 different student names uh, that had been submitted that they felt met the kind of the parameters of what the Hope Squad was. As advisors, uh, we spent time after school looking through those and starting to go what we, what's called a vetting process. Uh, during our training uh, with Mr. Walt Rolfs, Hope Squad has a kind of vetting process that they ask the advisors to go through. It's not to say no to any kid, but it's to make sure that the kids that are being asked for uh, don't have any potential red flags uh, that could uh, possibly interfere with what the Hope Squad is wanting to do. And so we sat down and we went through that. We relied on the counselors. We relied on, uh, relied on uh, a lot of the principals and things like that and asked them, said, can you take a look at this? Finally, in late October, uh, we started to let the students know uh, that they had been selected by their peers. This was a 100% peer process. Every student that sits on the Hope Squad, which right now we have 43 kids that are currently serving on the Host, uh, Hope Squad, 
Every single one of those was selected by their peers uh, inside of that. Uh, in November, uh, we started to have parent and student meetings. Uh, we asked the parents to come in and to talk to us to make sure that they were okay with their students serving on the Hope Squad. Given the nature of the material of what the Hope Squad deals with, we wanted to make sure that the parents were fully informed as well of what we are going to be trying to train these students in and to make sure that they were completely comfortable with it. Uh, and so we talked with the students, we talked with the parents, uh, and if the parents could not meet, uh, if they couldn't come to one of the meetings, we sent home information with the student as well as emailed it to them and then got signed confirmation from all parents that yes, they were okay and comfortable with their uh, students serving on the HOPE Squad. Uh, finally, once we had our, our, our numbers, in December of 23, we started holding our very first uh, meetings with our HOPE Squad students. HOPE Squad has a design curriculum that is set forth. In year number one, they have certain modules that you wanna go through. And so that's what we started going through in December of 23. And I can let Kobe talk about that here in just a moment. We also attended uh, Hall County Youth Prevention Summit uh, where they started uh, kind of helping the students also look at different risk factors that can lead into uh, what can happen with uh, suicide, uh, things to look out for, uh, different risk factors that increase uh, the risk of suicide. And so we had a great full day convention uh, that we went to there and got some great information. And we've continued our curriculum meetings so far in January of 24. Our freshmen and sophomores started to meet with Jerlene Mosley uh, to utilize the strengths finders of our, of our student body uh, and how their strengths can play into uh, the HOPE Squad as well. So we're starting to try and pull in other pieces that we currently use uh, inside of our school system already to help kind of grow uh, what this program is. Future, we're gonna start playing what we call Hope Week up at the high school. And Hope Week is to really start showcasing to the student body what Hope Squad is and what it is. Uh, the, the rollout seems kind of slow. Uh, you might ask, and people might ask you, like, I, don't, I haven't really heard a lot about it. And that's by design. Uh, Hope Squad wants the students to be comfortable before we ask those students to go out and start talking about what the Hope Squad is so that they can answer the questions, so they know what the different warning signs that they can be looking for. Uh, so it is a slower rollout, but that is by design to make sure that we fully make sure that our students that are going through these trainings have an understanding of what it is they're looking for, the different risk factors and so forth. Uh, in April 24, we will have a week-long Hope Week uh, where our Hope Squad students will uh, be helping the, the rest of the student population understand what the Hope Squad is, what the intention of Hope Squad is, uh, and to start getting them more comfortable uh, and to feel that they have that uh, voice of reason to go to uh, for them. Uh, and then in May of 24, we will start to wrap up this year and we will start to plan for next year uh, with our freshmen, sophomores, and juniors, as well as our staff. And we'll also start to plan our freshman elections uh, into the August of 24 years. So that's kind of what it uh, uh, looks like for the future. The process that Hope Squad wants you to go for in year one, it's module trainings for students to recognize what the warning signs are. There's four main modules that they want us to go through. We are currently in between modules three and four right now with those students. So that's where we're at the point where we feel comfortable being able to start fully implementing it to the rest of the student body. Year two is a more proactive approach to implement to the entire student body. You'll start to see our members more and more active within the school. Uh, starting to be more active uh, in creating a social media account that we've already kind of started to talk with uh, Mitch about to start getting it out there to not just our students but also to the rest of uh, the community of what it is. And then by year three, we have complete full implementation, uh, implementation with the school uh, and everywhere, community partners and so forth. And then in year four, it's the continuance of the program as well as the sustainability of the program. So it's just kind of a really brief process of what it is. Uh, Kobe had volunteered to kind of come in. Uh, I'd like to turn it over to give him a chance to just kind of give his perspective of what we've done so far. Um, to me, um, Hope Squad is like one of the best things that could probably could happen to the school, not only for the students, but for the staff, because I feel like the students will be more comfortable with giving the outreach to the, like, Hope Squad members like myself, and then we can talk to like the trusted adults that we 
our like our advisors and stuff like that. Um, I just feel like um, we we need we needed something like this because of what has happened in the past, like with like students with overdose and with the suicide threats. And one of the main things that stuck with me from that um, convention is not asking what's wrong with the person, ask what's happened to the person. Instead of just assuming like they're just having a bad day, just ask what's what happened in the past to make you like react like that to something. And it just always has stuck with me since that convention. And I feel like hope again. I feel like Hope Squad um, will eventually help students more and more as the years go by. It kind of does suck because I'm a senior, but I want to make sure this program keeps going, like and helps the students more and more. Like I know all the like freshmen, sophomores, and se uh, juniors. Like I know that they'll keep this thing going and um, make a strong impact on the school. Any questions? Mr. Linsky. Maybe I'm not understanding this in my brain a little bit here, but you have your four years here. The first one is module training for students and starting to recognize the warning signs. Are you doing that every year? Because I feel that as seniors leave and freshmen come in, if they're not, if you're going straight to year two, they're missing a key part. It doesn't matter what year you land on. No, no. So there, there's like 26 different modules. <clears throat> and so when we bring our freshmen in, they're going to start with the first year modules. And then our sophomores will continue on through the other modules. Okay. So, so we're you're not doing it all together then? No. Okay. So That's what we, I was understanding. Thank you. Yeah, no problem. Ms. Albers. Um, so I've only been here for seven years, but um, anyway, Kobe, I'm super proud of you and um, and thank you for implementing this program. We did hear about it um, a year ago, and I was kind of going, "What's happening with that?" I was very curious about it, and we've been talking a lot about mental health in in, in student population. Everybody's talking about it now, and I just think this is a really nice uh, alternate support that we can offer for students. And um, and Kobe, I'm curious, were were you surprised when your peer group picked you to be um, one of the people that they would want to talk to? I wouldn't say I was surprised. I was more, um, not proud, but like, I was more, <clears throat> I felt like it was a great opportunity for me, like, because, like, I do talk, I try to reach out to all the students at the school, like, and I'm, I, I'm involved with a lot in the school, and I just, I'm, I was more in shock because, like, I'm surprised, like, I was, like, that implemented to the school, like, people at, at that school, yeah. I guess. You were having an, a very intentional impact on a lot of students that you may not have known, and right. you should be proud. I mean, I'm proud of you. I think it's, it's really an amazing honor, and so, um, and some people might have been really intimidated by that, but you said yes, and you went through the training, and I... Um, I think that's amazing. And what you said about um, you don't ask people what's wrong with them, you ask them what happened to them. Right. You know, I, I was reading a book about that just a couple of weeks, ago, a couple of years ago, when, um, and it really helps me, even as an adult, to, to understand where someone is coming from. Right. You know, everybody's had their trauma, everybody has their, their difficult times, and it, it is, really helps you understand where someone's coming from, even if you don't agree with them, even if they're being mean or whatever, right. it still helps you un understand that. So well done, you will take that into adulthood. You will use that for the rest of your life. So well done. Thank you. Mr. Hawley. Not necessarily a question, more of a plug for Kobe. So Kobe and I have gotten to know each other a lot more lately because Kobe's a show choir kid and I'm a show choir dad. And we see each other from 7 a.m. to 10 p.m. every Saturday right now, and it's a great time. <laughs> and uh, going back to what you were talking about with students selecting students, I might have been skeptical about that too. But it's interesting because I didn't know, Kobe, that you were one of the, the Hope Squad members. And um, 
we talk about when we're at these show choir events, we talk about students as, as a parent group. And we say all kind of great things about Kobe, even as the dad group, we're like, yep, there's a leader, you know, and, and so I'm proud of you for, for this accomplishment. And I was wondering, because you and I have had conversations about what your next steps are, if you would share with the board what your plans are for your future. Um, after high school, I just got accepted into Wayne State, and I plan on go going to major in psychology. So I can use that in, like, policing or as a paramedic so I can learn how to calm situations down and keep people in the right mental state of mind. And just, I feel like psychology is the best step for me because, again, Hope Squad is to help people, and I like helping people. I always have. And I love, like, getting out in the community, like doing community service with ROTC when we had ROTC. And, mm -hmm. yeah. Well, I think this is going to serve you well. Congratulations. Thank you. All right. Mr. Garcia Mendez. Sorry. <clears throat> um, no, thank you both for being here. Um, it's really awesome plans that you have in the future. Just keep going for them. Trust your gut um, and just keep going for it. I, I'm curious to know more about the risk factors um, associated uh, with students. I don't know if you could talk about that a little bit more just so that we can, we as a board can just know, like, what are those risk factors associated Sure. So like at the Youth Prevention Summit that we went to, some of the big risk factors that they're seeing uh, currently is obviously technological devices, uh, social media and things like that are playing a huge role in the risk factors of the increase uh, in students who attempt suicide, but also uh, kids who vape. Uh, kids who uh, use drugs and things like that, uh, they are starting to find the increase in attempts uh, when it comes to suicide. Uh, and then family life, uh, issues with friends, families, you know, all sorts of things. What some people would say, oh, just typical school sort of stuff. Uh, all those uh, are risk factors, but what we're starting to see is those are being magnified because of the other things that are also being available to them in terms of like the vaping uh, and things like that. We're just starting to see it pile up and get even worse. And who would you say supports students like throughout those processes, like at the school, like I guess if um, Kobe were to encounter a kid that was needing some of that kind of assistance, I guess who in the schools would play an important role in helping that student and, I guess, family in that situation? So th uh, that's the whole premise kind of behind what Hope Squad is, is to give those students access, access to students that understand what those risk, risk factors are to get them to a, an adult. Uh, and so it could be any one of the Hope Squad advisors as well as counselors, principals, social, social workers, uh, all of those elements of somebody that can immediately get them access to the help and the things that they need. Uh, and that's kind of the process that we're starting to go through is, is to help them identify when student A comes to you your job is to come straight to one of your Hope Squad advisors or, you know, a counselor or a principal. That way we can immediately get them the help that they need to kind of start curbing that process of the thought. Awesome. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Mr. Hawley. Dr. Dexter, you might be a little more equipped to answer this. So I know we're just rolling this out in the high school um, and the program is just getting started. Have we talked about this at a middle school level? Yes, we have, and we had um, a couple of the elementary schools that were really pushing me to let's let's get this here. Um, it goes back to funding. Right now, it's all grant funded, and um, but we wanted to start at the high school. That was our highest need, and so that's in the background. Are we seeing grants for this at the middle school and elementary school level as well, or is there are there not a lot of those out there? Um, we were just using our Title IV funds. We have an ELO um, extended opportunity grant and. It's just that there's a lot of need <laughs> to spread it around. Yeah. Thank you. And I just want to give a shout out to the staff. Um, it's, this is a difficult topic to work with students on, and um, they do this on their own time. Um, Matt has been a great leader on pulling people together, um, but when I've met with them, they're, they're excited. They want to support students. They are just are just so impressed with the student leaders, and um, it, it's just been a a small group, but they're going to be powerful. Ms. Malda. Um, I was going to ask you, I know you just said that you had some elementary schools reach out to you. 
Um, is there going to be a lot of thought towards that as far as age appropriate? Because I know, you know, getting younger and younger, I feel middle school and high school is good, but I feel like when you get to that elementary, they're just not mature enough. And so that kind of concerns me. Right. And the whole curriculum at the elementary level is really focused more on bullying um, and not so much suicide. But um, just how do you, as a um, bystander, how do you report bullying? What's your role? Um, so it's focused more on that, uh, more on prevention strategies. So um, drug and alcohol prevention. Uh, we kind of went away from Red Ribbon Week. Uh, but just, you know, how do kids be positive, upbeat, support that, and have an urge <coughs> to do it. So it's, 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 it's a lot different at the elementary than middle school and high school. Okay, that was perfect, because yeah, I was like, okay, my fourth grader and my second grader, they're <laughs> very different. So I'm like, how are you, you know, going to implement that and keep it, you know, where kids' minds are at at those ages? Yep. So thank you. All right, thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks, you guys. Thank you so thank much. You. Item number 5.3, Summary of NDE, an External Continuous Improvement Visit. Dr. Summer Stevens. Good evening. Uh, so we're going to just do a quick summary of our recent uh, external visit from the Department of Education for our five-year continuous improvement review. Thanks to all of you from the board who were able to come in and participate uh, in interviews and also those of you that were able to participate in our exit review. So I want to also say thank you to the staff. There's some here, and uh, so between the district leadership team, the administrators, the school staff, um, all of our parents and students and our community members that participated. So I wanted to share that we had 16 external team members that range from people that work at the Department of Education, some work at educational service units, some are teachers, administrators in Nebraska, uh, other Nebraska school districts from all over the state really ranging from all the way from Scotts Bluff over to Gretna and everywhere in between so it was a great visit and really grateful I want to say thank you uh, Dr. Palmer and Dr. Dexter really got it kicked off uh, in the works last year and then we were able to kind of finish up and and get them in so the team uh, wanted to make sure they visited all of our elementary, middle, and high schools. So we didn't go to specialty programs, but they were able to make it to all of those buildings in two and a half days. Actually, in two days' time, they made it to all those buildings, and so we're grateful for that. They visited 112 elementary classrooms in two days, 41 middle school classrooms, and 26 high school classrooms. And during the time they were with us, they spoke to four of you, 36 administrators and le other leadership folks, 99 students, 103 certified staff, 22 classified staff members, 17 parents, and 15 uh, community stakeholders. So they saw a lot of people in Grand Island during that short time uh, that they were with us. So what we want to share tonight, when they're here, they look for a lot of things. They look for um, themes and evidence and they come up with commendations which commendations are really acknowledgments of the the efforts that we have that make a positive impact related to um, our continuous improvement efforts and so what we shared with them was the big strategic plan that's been in place um, most recently since 2021 uh, but we also focus them down into the three priorities that we've been focusing on over the last year year and a half uh, which is instruction positive supports, and PLCs. Um, and so they wanted to give us some feedback on those three goals. And then they also give us some recommendations, which are things that are not necessarily wrong, but things that we could continue to work on based on the evidence that they saw literally in two days' time, which is literally just a dipstick test. Um, they're in classrooms for five minutes. So uh, just like we go into classrooms potentially 10 to 15 to 20 to 30 times in a year and give feedback, they were in there for five minutes. So we have to keep in perspective what they see is just, again, 
in, in one point in time, uh, but again, from our evidence and so on. So commendations wise, here we go. The most important thing that I think I would like to suggest we take away, uh, one of the pieces that we asked them on the Sunday when we met with them to kind of kick off the visit, we said, we want to know if people feel supported. And when we said people, we didn't articulate, do teachers feel supported by administrators, or do kids feel supported by teachers, or do administrators feel supported by the district people? We didn't ask any specifics. We just said, do people feel supported? And the very first commendation for the district was that they felt like we in Grand Island Public Schools have a supportive environment. And that went from all the way from students to teachers, to support staff, to building leaders, to district leaders, to parents, to community members, to district leaders, to the board, like all the way across. That was support everywhere. Administration teachers, students felt supported by each other and again from, from everyone else. That we had established routines and family atmosphere contribute to students feeling emotionally and physically safe. And that the staff clearly care about kids. I think they mentioned several times, and some of you that were in that interview could, uh, exit interview could talk about it. They kept talking about that we feel like a small place, like we're a small community feeling. Would that be accurate? I think they said that more than once. But that this is a supportive place. And I don't think we could ask for anything more than that because ultimately, yes, we want to learn, and that's why we're here. But in the end, if, if we don't have this, then we don't have anything. So very super proud of this. The second commendation is an instruction. Well, heck, if that's goal number two, or goal number one is instruction, and we're getting a commendation on instruction, then again, I don't think it can get better than being supportive and having a commendation about instruction. Instructional staff introduce lessons with learning targets and success criteria. Well, those are some of the most important parts that, again, if kids know the map of where they're trying to go and what it, how will I know if I get there, that's really the first part of a true PLC. The use of high-quality instructional materials is evident across, um, across, all grade, or across the grade levels so that we can ensure guaranteed and viable instruction within the district and that PLCs enhance collaboration between teachers in aligning the instructional methods. So that was evident when they went out across um, elementary, middle, and high school and what they saw at the district level. So again, to see this in a commendation is really important because uh, it wasn't just in the written materials and evidence that they saw, they heard it in the interviews, they saw things that re reflected this in the classrooms, and they saw it across everything that we presented. And the third commendation comes in data utilization. So this is really the evidence, the, the evidence of learning, of behavior data, the evidence of what they saw, um, actually uh, visually saw out in the classrooms. But teachers, administration, uh, leadership for learning, and the PLC groups collect and organize data to make informed decisions. And that strong leaders promote data literacy efforts to ensure data systems and build collective capacity among staff. Again, this district has had uh, a great process in place that runs, I'm going to say, from May through May uh, in the way that they run the academic summit process because it, it is, again, a gathering to reflect upon the year, to build a, and prepare for the next year. And that builds for the building leadership and, and the teachers within it to prepare uh, to come back together to, to put into place strategies for learning uh, and improvement. And then they carry that out throughout the year and then they come back together to reflect on how it went and prepare for the next year. Uh, and that's part of the, the work that I think is so important. So those commendations all together, um, I think are just so extremely uh, important. And I, I am new here, so I, I didn't have a lot to do with that. But I'm really proud of the work that everyone did to get here. Uh, and so I want this district to be extremely proud of that work as well. So moving forward, uh, we got some recommendations as well. 
And recommendations uh, are what the external team provided as suggestions or proposals as the best course of action, in their opinion, from being here for that, that bit of time, for sustaining continuous improvement efforts. Professional input that aims to pos uh, positively impact student learning experiences and achievement outcomes for the next continuous improvement cycle. These are areas that may be in place to some degree, but could be enhanced. The, the first recommendation is consistency of implementation. So although district level strategic plans are in place and processes are created for building level plans, I'm going to say that's what we're talking about with that um, academic summit and our building level teams and, and that process that we have for continuous improvement. Consistency in building level plan impl implementation varies. So we do bring everyone together and we have a model and they come together at academic summit and they put, start putting their plans together. But what they're talking about is it's not, again, it's, it, they're saying we could continue to build consistency. So not every building functions in exactly the same way. They're not functioning on all the same cylinders at all the same time, um, which again, to expect that to be the case, um, I, you know, maybe we'll get there, but that's just a goal. Uh, and that's our recommendation. Data analysis, root cause analysis, and strategy implementation needs to be monitored to ensure plans are truly making improvement in school processes and student success. So again, it's just that ongoing uh, checking in. Uh, I call it follow through and follow up. Like, are we doing what our plan says and have we checked in to see if it's working? Um, it's just putting, again, those continued uh, processes into place to, to monitor, assess, adjust, um, and that's just part of the process. So uh, I think we were all in agreement uh, pretty consistently that that sounded like a great recommendation. The second recommendation that was made, we're gonna encapsulate the third recommendation in here as well, and I did wanna follow up that uh, Dr. Levas really encapsulated it and we asked her to the additional recommendation with our English um, language learners and newcomers but the differentiated learning supports for students, number two, this for us is, again, really an important second recommendation that we're, um, I'm, I wouldn't say excited about, but we're, we're embracing. So the district has really felt that it has turned its focus to ensuring t solid tier one instruction. Like we must ensure that everyone has that solid base foundation. Um, in doing so, when we say everyone must have that solid tier one instruction um, so that we could then move on to supporting kids in tier two instruction, we don't have a lot of room to differentiate. We haven't been differentiated within tier one and kids have a lot of different needs in tier one. So uh, that's the next step for us is how do we start adjusting in tier one when kids don't all need the same thing at the same time. Um, and so that's the suggestion there. So how do we provide academic support and then that professional development for staff uh, surrounding formative assessment pra practices and processes uh, so that we can do that? So we can adapt and adjust within the tier one classroom uh, so that we can make those adjustments and not just wait until tier two to adjust for those, few, those kids that need the tier two intervention level so that we can adapt and adjust within tier one classrooms. But that's an ongoing process um, that we, again, supported this wholeheartedly, and that's for all students, not just subgroups of students, but for all students, um, so that we can individualize. And you're gonna see now in next steps how we do that. So they're next steps. Um, one of the things that, that I haven't talked a lot about, I'm a real big proponent of personalizing learning for kids, and this is the very first one. Um, how do we create ownership for kids? How do they embrace, like, I own my work, I own what I'm here to do each day. I think the teachers here in the district really own the work. Um, now, how do we move on for students to own every day what I do each day in the classroom um, and internalize the success criteria that we set and how do I monitor my own learning? And that's the next step to this because then when students start to do this, um, that is how we start to really differentiate because kids can say, like, I, I don't, I don't need as much here or I'm not getting it. And then that really helps the teacher know that they can start adjusting and adapting. The second next step is to
to uh, really grow a collaboration between buildings to develop strengths and guaranteed and viable systems. So really how, you know, right now, buildings are really doing a great job. And some buildings do times where they're together, but how could we, um, their suggestion is how could we build on that? How could we have buildings working with buildings more frequently? Third um, next step that they suggest, how can we continue to provide continuous education for administrators? We have a lot of different things that we do right now, but how can we look at that and consider if there's anything that we could do differently or in addition to? And then uh, more differentiated professional learning opportunities for staff. Two other suggestions they made for next steps. Taking that great di di uh, data utilization that we have and continuing to always grow everyone's data literacy uh, so that all staff continue to uh, let that data drive their decision making, their root cause analysis, that differentiated instruction, you know, making sure we have the tools in their hands to make those decisions easily so they're not sifting through data that's just right at their fingertips. And then the last piece is to continue to develop their skills at, like that just in time formative assessment so that they have those tools to make that I'm going to say that that tier one uh, instructional decision making to differentiate. So just continuing to build those skills in formative assessment. So as we get the formal report back, we will take that, review it, of course, see, um, you know, again, it's a point in time. So it doesn't tell the whole story. It tells the story they saw on those days, um, the story that each building told to the team, the story we told as a district leadership team with the evidence we produced. Um, and what we talked about was, this is our opportunity as a district to, I'm gonna say, get aligned with the cycle of the five-year continuous improvement cycle of the state with the district strategic plan cycle, because it's kind of like a year off a bit, and align the cycle together so it's t that we can put those two uh, together, but take this plan and use this as the jump off point to align those two plans together. Um, and again, not reinvent the wheel, but say like, what did we learn? Where are we at? And how can we now move forward with instruction, positive supports, PLCs, uh, because we think this is the right track to be on. What's our data tell us? Where do we need to um, focus? How do we put our strategies together? How do we put our collective efforts together? Where do we put our funding together? And, and where do we put our um, collective energies for the next three to five years as a system? Um, but just super proud of everyone. Um, as the report comes in, uh, we get a chance to review it. We make the plans forward for strategic planning. Mr. Fisher, as he, as he leads us forward with that work, um, we'll get this um, information out to everyone in the district and uh, be available to, to people to review. But happy to answer any questions and anyone else from the district leadership team is welcome to also answer those if you have them. Mr. Hawley. Does that review process, once you get it all back, um, who's involved in that? Is it multiple groups, um, maybe building administrators at one point, and then district leadership team? Who all is going to look at this and, and start devising the next steps? For, like, in terms of the plan itself? Yeah, in terms well, of reviewing it and taking yep. the information that they gave us and seeing what we can implement. Mm -hmm. Well, Mr. Fisher, you want to talk at all about that? We've been talking about that. <laughs> Push wrong button. Too many buttons. <laughs> so, no, we we've started that discussion uh, as far as who needs to be involved in that process, and and it's probably going to be multiple groups. Mm -hmm. There's, you know, there may be, a, you know, uh, the district leadership team may work together to kind of create a, a framework for where we're going to go because usually. That helps move the process along. If we just turn people loose with the blank paper and say, here, let's have you develop a strategic plan, that that's kind of a, a painful process. So, you know, we'll, we'll probably start creating some kind of a framework. But then as we move through it, we, we certainly will involve different groups because we do need different perspectives on, on those pieces uh, 
as far as what was identified. And then, you know, one of the things that, that we've done some work around in the last year is, is looking at the, the current strategic plan and really talking about, well, what things on this strategic plan have been accomplished? What things could we check off? Um, so I think, again, going back to, to what Dr. Stevens said as, as far as, you know, using that plan as, 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 a, as a jumping off point to develop the next, the next plan and then using the information that we get from this external visitation, um, you know, putting those two things together to, to really act as a foundation for starting the new plan. And then, like I said, once we get, get things moving, then we probably are going to bring in you know, administrators, obviously, at some point in time, we're going to want some feedback from, you know, from, from teachers and, and support staff in, in different areas that, uh, you know, obviously are probably going to tie to the things that we feel like are, are we're headed towards in that strategic plan. Thank you. Ms. Malden. So two things, I think that's pretty awesome. The fact that you said they said it feels like a small community. Like, I mean, for having around 10,000 students, <laughs> that's a really good feeling. That means like, it's like we're all like working together and like we're a great team and that's just great. <laughs> um, the second thing is, I know you talked about the consistency in buildings, we could do better. And I know I'm gonna ask your standpoint on that, like how you feel about that and what we're gonna kind of try to do. But I know consistency in buildings it's, it's hard mm -hmm. I mean I work in agriculture and we have different offices and we always talk about it'd be nice you know if everybody did like kind of the same thing right. but in my mind I feel like it, it's impossible <laughs> I mean we're all different people there's different principals different just administrators and teachers and everybody's kind of gonna shift things a little to make it work for you know their school mm -hmm. so I kind of that's something that's always interesting to me because like I'm a very systematic person so I know like okay, this is how you want it done, and I, like, follow each step, but I know, like I said, everybody's different, so I'd like to know your input on that. Well, I think that, that the, the consideration in what they shared, it, it came back to in, I'm going to say, in the commendations, but the district currently has, I'm going to say, a model, and so I think the key will be continuing to ensure that we have the model, and then the, the follow, like I said, I call it the follow-through and the follow-up, that's the piece that I think we just need to continue to work with so that we're giving effective feedback. That's true, um, and that's part of what we're working on actually in the building is, is making sure that, that principals are giving teachers effective feedback and that teachers are giving kids effective feedback. I mean, we at the district level need to continue to do the same thing. And so just, again, living that out is something that we have to remind ourselves and continue to practice. Uh, not that people aren't doing that, but I think it's, again, continuing to uh, to walk the talk, right? And that's part of, uh, I think, the conversation that we will probably have as we review the report is seeing if there are any breakdowns to that, but just coming back to putting those, uh, we, I'm pretty big into standard operating procedures, but, and I mean, maybe that's too simplistic, but just ensuring that we have, you know, that we review what our standard operating procedures, for lack of a better term, are, what our models are, and that what our practices are to, to carry that out. And again, the, this district has much better models and much better practices than many places that I've been. So it's just ensuring that, that we're following through on that um, through trainings that we have um, and ensuring those pieces are in place and checking back in. And that's the part that I think oftentimes is just the hardest thing to do. And maybe even in your own jobs, it's like that. It's the follow through that I think sometimes can get us and that's in life. Because uh, we have the models and you probably have the models, but it's the follow through. No, I completely agree with you, and I, I love that our models are pretty, you know, all set a certain way, and like you just said, follow up and following through. I just actually went through some training with work for re reliability and accountability, and it is, it's that following up and, you know, following through, and you have to do that, so thank you. Yep. Mr. Garcia Mendes. Thank you. Um, kudos to you and then all the staff. I mean, uh, Mr. Fisher and just everyone um, who was part of the process, thank you for um, kind of enduring that, I guess, and um, being there. Um, I always like to think that feedback is always um, amazing because it only improves um, individuals and systems at, um, at play. 
Um, but I'd also like to say kudos to the previous board members and previous um, people who were part of the district because they laid the groundwork uh, for all of the current work um, that has been done and continues to be do, um, uh, done. And I guess I'm just looking forward to how we're going to progress the district in the future um, and really just make our school district successful. So, yeah, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Stevens. Okay, item number 5.4, priority project list. Mr. Dan Petch. Thanks, President McFarland. I'm so glad to be the highlight of your night. So I'm gonna go ahead, <laughs> I'm gonna go ahead and, and hand this around to everybody. So um, project list, big thing. We, we typically start uh, the process in September. So I'll talk a little bit about the process. We've already reviewed this with facility finance. So Lisa, you can go ahead and take a bathroom break. Um, but uh, what we do is, is we, we take the list that we have for each building, which amounts about, about 50 pages total. <clears throat> and we go through that. Uh, with each of the buildings, I go to all the principals and, and review that. So then and we establish some building priorities. And so when you look at the list that uh, is going around there, um, we, we have the building location, project description, and then you'll see BP, that's building priority. And then DP would be district priority. And then totals, um, the project types, a lot of them, those are safety. And then to the right of that would be some of our funding sources. Uh, there's a four of those and then some notes about what specifically those funding sources might be outside of the general fund. So again, spending time with the buildings, then also my team, uh, we sit down and go through in depth uh, with, again, every building, everything we got. Um, most things on this list are must do's for the most part as long as we have funding. Uh, so I can tell you that um, the first half of this, um, I, I believe that we will accomplish, and then we'll get into some things that um, if we can fund those, then we will move those forward. And that's kind of the hard part. Um, so with the, you know, 41 items on there, uh, I can't guarantee that we'll get all 41 accomplished. And sometimes uh, we have to, um, you know, move a few of these forward into next year. And some of these items on here um, are just that. So uh, while I'm thinking about it, I do want to acknowledge um, all my staff, again, put a lot of time into this, especially my assistant, uh, Gabby Ryan. So uh, she's, she's been very instrumental in, in generating uh, what you see in front of you. Again, this comes from a, about 50 pages we condensed down into this one. So. And as I go along, if you guys got questions, uh, just interrupt me and let me know, because I'm going to rattle through these pretty quickly. Um, so just getting started, uh, number one, uh, Gates Elementary, we're doing a tuck point project, um, something that is high need uh, on an old building. Uh, Neil Administration, um, the district security camera server upgrade, uh, safety thing, and that's in, in process right now. Uh, Westridge Middle School uh, replaced a condenser on the roof. Um, had a, a big issue there, um, the late or midsummer kind of thing. So uh, we'll have to get that done before summer hits. Uh, Westridge uh, also we're going to do a security vestibule there, a smaller version of, of some of what we had done uh, this last summer with projects. West Lawn uh, got to replace uh, their boilers. Allender Annex, uh, some revisions we'll need to do to move Success Academy over to the, that location. Um, uh, being that we're going to move out of the Wyandotte building potentially uh, this summer. Uh, senior High, um, phase one for installing overhead projection, overhead projectors in the ceilings. Um, and then also Senior High, um, replace door number 21 with card access. Uh, just that door is the west uh, 400 wing door um, over by the north kitchen. Uh, new elementary uh, replacing north windows with an aluminum upgraded system. 
uh, Bar Middle School. Um, we're, we all have done this already when we waterproofed the uh, two-story area there on the south side of the building. That was actually a, a, an insurance claim piece, so that was that funding source. Uh, Wasmer, we're going to move forward with a, a student student furniture replacement, and then with that we want to use our SO3 dollars to do so. Uh, we are eyeballing one other potential location uh, that we might do that, just depending on uh, when we get to the end of our SR3 spend and see if we have enough to implement that. Uh, Howard Elementary, um, same funding source, but replacing media center, uh, circulation desk, and furniture. Uh, Westridge, replacing the thermostats throughout the building. Westridge um, adding the sidewalk from the school to the 13th Street crosswalk. Um, this is a carryover from last year. Engelman expanding the sidewalk on the east side of the building, um, also carryover from last year. Uh, Bar Middle School um, irrigation system for the practice fields and the southwest parking area. It's non-irrigated presently, so that's a safety item because kids can get hurt if, um, on the turf that they're playing on right now. Dodge uh, Elementary installing a fire sprinkler system in just that north wing. That was, was not done. Uh, Walnut Middle School, um, new aluminum storefront and north cafeteria entrance at door number 18. Um, Lincoln Elementary. Um, replace classroom faucets and around all classrooms and also the commons counter and sink a small item but needed connect room elementary replace existing lighting with led and uh, and half that building so when we did our project um, this last year we did half the building so this will kind of close that up shoemaker um, and El engelman uh, replace phone systems uh, that's uh, kind of a five-year plan, so these are next two buildings we're adding to that. Uh, Gates, uh, adding a drop-off pickup lane on the west side of the building. That's a carryover from last year. Uh, Newell, doing some tuck point work um, on the north and south sides of the building. Uh, Lincoln Elementary, um, upgrade classrooms with security locks. Um, Neil building replace carpet on the second floor if you've ever been up there you know it's a high need actually almost getting to a safety thing Wasmer Elementary replace uh, four uh, wash basins <laughs> West Lawn um, reworking the concrete drive for better traffic flow uh, Westridge and uh, Walnut replace security camera systems the uh, reason that's kind of down here lower uh, is that would be grant funded so I'm not um, super confident that that's something we'll be able to do potentially this year if we if it happens a little quicker than we expect then yeah we'll do it this year um, Walnut uh, replacing PE lockers with smaller lockers uh, just having a they have numbers and we're having a hard time accommodating them with the, with the lockers they have uh, career pathways sealing the metal roof on the northeast uh, storage building uh, senior High, uh, refinish the West Gym floor and the auditorium stage. West Lawn, install integrated card access throughout buildings, so we're just picking up what we um, weren't able to accomplish with the ESSER dollars this last time. Dodge, um, install ceiling mount projectors in all classrooms. That might get uh, parsed back to being phased similar to the Senior High. Uh, Newell, um, add uh, new furniture uh, in the West Pod area. And then that would be a, the I mentioned earlier too. We might be able to use us for three dollars to outfit and do the classrooms as well. Uh, Bar Middle School replace carpet at the three story. Uh, Neil Building paint recock exterior building. Um, something we'll probably look at doing in phases. Uh, Neil Neil Building. I put this just under the Neil, but doing security film on exterior doors. This would be all of our buildings throughout the district. So um, buildings, we've got the security vestibule, it has a security film, but we would like to target the other exterior doors around the perimeter of the building. Um, and then I, I include this because this has been a, a large cost and hit to my uh, budget over the last several years, and that's just replacing heat pumps throughout the district in our heat pump buildings. Just so for instance, Senior High's got 240 just that one building and so 
Um, it's it's, it's kind of it's been becoming a thing. So um, I ran through that pretty quick. I don't know if there's any questions. If there's anything I missed, F and F folks, let me know. That was almost painless. <laughs> All right, thank you, Mr. Holly. Oh. Dang it. I, well, my question doesn't necessarily pertain to your list, and maybe I just haven't driven past it. Where are we at on the new playground for Newell? I know it's an insurance thing. Is that is that coming? It is. Um, actually, the uh, uh, equipment just arrived uh, this week, and uh, so we have to schedule that installation with that company. So still waiting for word back on that. Um, my, my hope is that that's something we can get in prior to school getting out, but we are, we're on that waiting list. We also have to wait for weather. Okay. And so best case scenario would probably be April, but I'm not going to make any promises. It's okay. It's good news. Thank you very much. Thanks. Ms. Malden. So I guess this is maybe a dumb question, but I guess no question's dumb. But so looking at like where you have special building fund, general depreciation, other sources, et cetera, is all this going to be like it's going to go as what needs done first? Because just thinking of like the budget cut and like looking at these numbers, it's like, <laughs> like very painful. Mm -hmm. So I just wanted to like get an explanation on how this exactly works. Um. I always look for funding sources outside the general fund. And so th that's what you see right there. And um, to, to tell you that just spending a million dollars on, on what we are out of general fund isn't even getting what we need to be. Um, <clears throat> just going off of our um, Amoresco data, which is what uh, program we use to uh, identify all of the needs for all of our buildings and put it on those lists that I mentioned. Um, their recommendation we should be spending more like $7.8 million a year. No way that's going to happen. And so we just look at the hard and fast things of, of what we have to have to do uh, and look for those other funding sources because, um, you know, very much aware uh, of where we are financially and what's coming at us. Uh, but these are the kind of the have tos. I also, you know, do try to spread out a couple little things for every building for the most part, unless they're a brand new building. So we do try to hit everybody. So when you see that little eight thousand dollar thing on there for Lincoln, I mean, does it need to be on here? Well, at least we, we mentioned we're doing something at Lincoln. So does that kind of answer the question? Yeah. Yeah, because I just needed a little explanation on it because I know, like, just looking at it, and I'm a number person, so I'm like, okay, like, how do you really yeah, it's, see it's, what exactly needs to be done? That way we're making sure what needs to get done gets done, but at the same time, you know. It's pretty hard this year uh, with that in mind and, and then just the things that we have to continue to kind of kick the can forward on and not do, so. Okay, what's BP and DP mean? That's it. Uh, district priority and building priority. Okay. So DP is not Dan Patch priority, by the way. <laughs> Thank you. Mm -hmm. Mr. Hawley. One more quick question. Perhaps I missed it. How much of this work ballpark are you self-performing, percentage-wise maybe? Um, probably at least a quarter. OK. Um, we, we're using our own forces for a, a good deal of those. Uh, the conicrum lighting, for instance, um, depends. We might do some of the overhead projector piece. Um, I'd have to kind of go back through those, but yeah, a lot of these are just material only. And you may just reevaluate as you come up on them on the list and see if you have the resources, and then if not, stick with the original plan. Exactly. Okay. And then again, if, if we are not, and unable to uh, get them done this year, uh, potentially then we'll show back up on next year's priority <coughs> list. Thank you. Thanks. All right. Thank you, Mr. Petch. Thanks. Yeah, item number 5.5, .5, GIPS Google Workspace Plus Multi-Year Agreement. Mr. Corey Gearhart. Yeah, I got nothing after that. Um, <laughs> so uh, what I'm bringing forward tonight is, a, is an upgrade to our current Google Workspace. So if you're familiar, Google offers, you know, its basic level workspace package to K-12 schools, actually K-20 for, for no charge. But over time, what they've done is incorporated additional features that were previously handled by third parties that would 
uh, be partners with Google, and they brought some of those features back in house. So um, today we uh, we currently have um, a security system or a security package that we use. It's a partner vendor partner with uh, Google Workspace, and that costs us a, a pretty substantial amount of money every year. And so what this is actually is a uh, cost to replace that particular software because those features, many of them and some additional ones have been incorporated into the core product. And so that makes our administration a little bit easier, our data access and security a little bit um, tighter and, and brings it all into one place. So um, in addition to that, um, this also helps with, um, there's a transition right now at our high school where they were previously using a learning management system called Canvas and they're transitioning away from Canvas back into Google Classroom. Currently, um, K-8, we have Google Classroom available for teachers to use with their staff, and that is integrated with our student information system. But what this actually does is because of the feature set that we're looking at getting for the security side, we're also getting additional features on the, on the learning management system. And so we've met with L4L and we've brought Google in to do some product demonstrations and show them the additional things that are gonna uh, going to come from that. So while this product is handling the security, it's also replacing Canvas. It's also replacing a product called Turnitin, which is a anti-plagiarism uh, type product that a lot of schools use to take submissions from students and make sure that it's, um, that they're not, that they're original, right? And so all that combined um, comes up to about um, $52,000 a year. And so this particular quote is for a $42,000 year one cost and then $40,000 a year for the next two years. So we're actually saving close to $12,000 a year. By doing this, we'll save $10,000 the first year and then over the next two years reap that additional $2,000 savings. So any questions I can answer about this particular proposal? Mr. Garcia Mendez. Thank you. Uh, so you mentioned it checks like plagiarism and all of that. Um, does it have the chat GPT? Does it check if like students use that or not? Or? Um, so the problem with generative AI is they produce new content. So it, most of the plagiarism detection tools right now um, work by matching patterns that are also available as they've scoured the web. And so with generative AI, you can actually tell it, I'd like you to produce new content, I'd like you to do it at an eighth grade level, or I'd like you to do it at a 10th grade level, or whatever, and it's gonna produce that. It, it runs a little bit of a problem, right, detecting that, and quite frankly, I think all of the companies right now that manage originality scores for this are struggling with that same thing. So um, there's, there's ways to, to work with students. There's ways to look at, use the system. Um, right now in Google Docs, there's a history feature. So you can see whether or not someone has just copied and pasted 20 pages of text into a document all at once at one time and, and suddenly it's there and it's done versus you can see the actual revising and editing process that happens with the document and you can go back in the history and see, well, they wrote this paragraph and then they came back in and updated and changed it. One thing where this is a little different too is students can actually submit their own work and they get feedback on that work. And by doing that, they can say, this, this needs cited. Like it will actually say, this is something that's gonna flag. And so you need to, to figure out the right way to cite this so that it's appropriate for the work that you're doing in this class. So it kind of helps students uh, lift them up and, they're, you know, and, and get them to a point where they're, they're using the tools correctly and, doing the kind of work that we want to see them do. Sorry. <laughs> why are we all, I don't know why we're all having issues tonight. Happening. Sorry. Hey, is it's that? the red one. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. It's the new seats, that's what it is. Oh. Just kidding. Hey, is that is that shift? I don't know if this would be for you to answer, Corey, or um, maybe someone from a different department. But that shift away from Canva is that? Um, do, are you guys seeing that colleges are using Google Classroom more than Canva? They're they're not. It's it's Canvas or Canvas. Um, excuse yeah, me. Yeah, Canvas the yeah different one. So yeah, graphic design. Yeah. A, a lot of the, the 
post secondaries are using still using Canvas or Schoology or some of, or you know Blackboard. Um, the issue that we ran into was just the cost and complexity, right? So that's been the challenge for us. Okay. Mr. Holinsky. I got my buttons. It must be just that side of the room. Um, <laughs> correct me if I'm wrong. I think you heard it uh, in one of the meetings. This this is locked in, this rate, correct? It's not going to raise next year, then the year after that, even more than the year after that. It's locked yeah. in, right? Correct, yes. Okay, that's what I thought. Just wanted to double check. Thank you. Yep. And it's a three-year term. So after that, of course, I'm sure it will be slightly different. But we're actually working with some of my colleagues in the state in the larger districts to work with some vendors to get um, group buys on things like this and Microsoft specifically. Okay. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Thank you. Item 5.6 reduce specific certified staff positions. Dr. Kohler. A plan was presented in January to reduce the expenditure expenditures for the 24-25 year budget and tonight I'm following up with that with three of the specific positions that were identified in the plan I'm going to read the resolution that I'm asking you to take action on later tonight whereas due to changing programs budget limitations and other administrative and financial factors it is necessary that programs and staff positions offered by Grand Island Public School District be reviewed and that a determination be made as those programs and staff positions that should be discontinued, reduced, or changed, and whereas the school board has considered the foregoing and determined that it is necessary and appropriate to reduce programs and staff positions. Now, therefore, be it resolved that the following changes in programs and staff positions are made effective at the end of the 23-24 school year. Number one, eliminate one certified full-time equivalent from the aviation program effective as of May 23, 2024. Number two, eliminate one administrator full-time equivalent from the fine arts and social studies curriculum program on the leading for learning team effective as of August 15, 2024. And number three, eliminate one administrator full-time equivalent from the assessment research and accountability program on the Grand Island Public Schools Superintendent's District Leadership Team, effective as of August 15th, 2024. Questions for me? Questions for Dr. Kohler? Seeing none. Okay, thank you. Item 5.7.1, Board Operating Principles. Mr. Fisher. <coughs> okay. Um, <clears throat> this is a, a policy, actually, that we've spent quite a bit of time with um, between the uh, board retreat that we had back in that's too big, way too big. Back in October, um, we started a discussion around uh, this policy and then the uh, governor's committee actually spent quite a bit of time with it and then um, finally it's come to the, the policy committee for, for review. So there are uh, a number of things here in this operating procedures um, policy that I uh, just want to touch base on. Um, in the, the student commitments, there, there was some shuffling that, that took place uh, within those commitments. Um, you see the one that was struck there, and, and uh, it, we had found that there were two different places that there were these commitments listed. They were in this policy, and there was another uh, place where they were uh, a part of um, a strategic plan. And so... We went, spent time going through those. I think we have those refined down to um, where we felt like they, they needed to be this time. So that was one area. And then one of the other things that uh, 
we're recommending a change in in several different places is rather than uh, referencing a chain of command, we feel like really what we're talking about there is the chain of communication, basically the order that communication should take place when there is a, uh, a question that comes to the, to the surface. So there are multiple places there on that page. And then when we get to this next page, there actually was a an chart that illustrated this. And so again, changing the, the terminology from chain of command to chain of communication. And then one of the other things that was done there, you can see the crossed out uh, chart below. Um, really nothing was changed here other than the order. Um, being reversed from top to bottom, where it would say step one actually starting at the top rather than at the bottom. Uh, we just felt it was less confusing if it, when people look at a chart like that, that they would probably look at the top of the chart first. And so by having the first step in the process being at the top, we felt like it made more sense. And then as we move down through this, um, there, a couple of places here um, where we're talking about committees and uh, one of the things and we've had discussion around this um, as far as saying that the committees would meet monthly um, felt like sometimes there isn't a reason for the committee to meet so rather than saying that we are going to have a meeting every month uh, we would say that they would be monthly or uh, as needed so there's that, that change that's there. Um, there was a change also in the wording of the, the full board there, which is just for clarification, just so that we know whether we're talking about the committee or the full board. And then down below here, um, again, just trying to bring some clarification to, to what the process should be when, when somebody is not able to attend one of the, the committee <laughs> meetings that they are a part of. Um, and again, just sharing uh, the fact that they're not going to be able to attend with other board, board members and then whoever would be eligible or available um, to attend those. And then also uh, in part E there, uh, actually that would be if there is somebody that wanted to attend a committee meeting that they were not a part of that committee. Again, making that desire known and then um, if there was an available uh, slot for them to attend. Again, it's, it's all about staying within the quorum um, so that uh, we're not violating any open meetings acts with the committees. So there's that part. And then I think there are a couple other here in this small group meetings for uh, superintendent small group. Uh, again, just adding that monthly or as needed. Again, we've typically met every month with uh, the small group and that would certainly be the intent to continue that but there could be a time somewhere along the way that there wasn't a need for a meeting and so again just make that as needed um, board leadership again just a, a change that that we felt like made sense um, the way uh, the election process was is done currently um, is incumbents uh, for the president and vice president offices are required to uh, indicate an interest in rerunning for those positions each year within two days of the November board meeting. And then anyone else that would be interested in those positions was required to uh, express an interest in doing that by December 1st. We felt like it probably giving people as much time to decide what they wanted to do around those offices probably made sense. So rather than treating incumbents and non-incumbents differently, um, we just simply said that let's, let's make that as it says in C, that anyone that's interested in uh, being nominated for those positions to express that interest by January 5th. Then I think there's one more place down here. Eh, maybe not. Maybe that's it. I guess that is it. Oh, no, it is too. Down here on H. Um, 
this goes back to really ties together with the other other part that we had when we were talking about committees before um, H we're proposing to strike that where it says that the uh, president would serve in a, as an ex officio member of standing committees of the board and be available to substitute in any committee uh, with an impending absence again in the earlier committee language we made that so that uh, when somebody was going to be absent that they would share that and then any member that was available um, would be able to attend in their absence questions about this all right moving right along then thing about the uh, board member code of ethics is there is no proposed changes here so previously this has indicated that you are ethical and we figured that that can continue so there was no reason to, to make a change there so that would simply be a review um, board members compensation for expenses this one Mr. Harden bled all over this thing. <laughs> <laughs> I've never seen one torn up so bad. But what he ultimately did was he brought it in line with what we're basically doing as practices now. And, and so I think that uh, as you look through the changes that are there, some deal with uh, the naming of the district, which was one of the other policies that actually is uh, in the uh, action part of the, the meeting tonight um, really just cleaning up language um, in in most instances but uh, there you know again the per diem uh, when you get down to number four um, rather than doing expense reimbursements um, what we have gone to with all of our employees is is a per diem meal rate um, and you know that's really where we feel like the the board probably should follow that same process as far as a, a daily per diem um, so questions anyone uh, have a concern there want to read through something closer again I think it really does just simply bring the policy uh, to align with what uh, the practices currently are. Ms. Malden. Uh, since I'm new to policy, on this part where it says preferably travel expenses should be paid as a direct district payment to the event slash organization rather than as a reimbursement to a board member. Can you explain that? So rather than, you know, if, if you know you're going to be attending a conference or whatever, rather than having the board member pay for it and then be reimbursed and really that would be for any expense if we can if we can pay it through the district rather than a reimbursement that would be the preferable method we know sometimes it has to it has to happen that just the way things shake out that you know you have to pay for it and then then the district will reimburse it but wherever possible would like to have the district pay for it up front and then and again, it's an advantage to the, the board member as well to not have to go through that reimbursement process. Any other questions on that one? All right, that's all the policies we have for this information session. Okay, now on to action items. <coughs> Item number 6.1, GIPS Cybersecurity Licensing and Support Renewal. Mr. Gearhart. Hello again. Um, this is just a follow-up to last month where we're renewing our licensing and subscription for approximately 30 months for our firewalls and our endpoint protection. Um, so if there's any uh, additional questions, I'll be happy to answer them. Seeing none, at this time I would entertain a motion to approve the purchase of the cybersecurity licensing as presented. I make a motion to approve the purchase of the cybersecurity licensing as presented. Seconded by Ms. Albers. Discussion. 
Seeing none, we may proceed to vote. Motion passes. Thank you. Item 6.2, reduce specific certified staff positions. Dr. Kohler. <coughs> Any questions? No questions? At this time, I would entertain a motion to approve the reduction of specified certified staff positions. I make a motion to approve the reduction of specific certified staff positions. Second by Ms. Albers. Discussion. Seeing none, we proceed to a vote. Motion passes. <laughs> Item six point three. School district legal status. Mr. Fisher. Okay. This was, uh, again, a policy that, that didn't have a lot of change here. Um, it did, up in that first line. Um, our official designation according to the state is Hall County School District number two. And then we talked about eliminating the places where it says the Grand Island Public Schools and just making that Grand Island Public Schools. Questions for Mr. Fisher? This time I would entertain a motion. I make a motion to approve policy 1210 school district legal status as presented. Second by Ms. Malden. Discussion? Seeing none, proceed to a vote. Motion passes. Okay. Then we have school board legal status, um, which does not change, so simply uh, a review of that one. No discussion. I'd entertain a motion to approve the 2120 school board legal status as presented. I make a motion to approve policy 2120 school board legal status as presented. Second by Mr. Lewinsky. Discussion? Seeing none, proceed to a vote. Motion passes. Okay, policy 2340, conflict of interest. Again, there were no changes in this policy, so this would simply be uh, approved as reviewed. Set the motion to approve 2340, conflict of interest. I make a motion to approve policy 2340, conflict of interest as presented. Second. Second by Mr. Garcia Mendez. Discussion. Seeing none, proceed to vote. Motion passes. Okay, policy 2460, voting method. This would be the voting method for the school board to use, and there were no changes in this policy either. So again, it would be approved as reviewed. Accept the motion to approve as viewed. I make a motion to approve uh, policy 2460 voting method as presented. Second. Second by Ms. Albers. Discussion? Seeing none, proceed to vote. Motion passes. Okay, policy 8220, admission of resident students. Um, there is just one minor change in this one. Um, we are going to allow our maximum for our preschool classes to move up to 20 for next year. And so it's currently listed as 15, so there would be that change to uh, specify 20 as that number. I would entertain a motion to approve 8220, admission to resident students. I have a question. 
Oh, I'm you bet. Mr. Holly. Mr. Fisher, just to clarify, um, in moving up that student count in those classrooms, can you tell me how many paraeducators will be in there or assistants to assist with that change? Yeah. So currently there's one teacher, two paraeducators for 15, and we would propose leaving that the same. Again, this was part of our not really a cost-cutting measure because we're really not cutting any costs, but by increasing the number of students that we have in, in each of those classrooms, that will bring in additional revenue from the state. We also get to serve more preschool students that way. Thank you. Okay, I would entertain a motion to approve 8220. I make a motion to approve policy 8220, admission of resident students as presented. Second by Ms. Albers. Discussion? Seeing none, proceed to a vote. Motion passes. Okay, policy 8331, intra-district transfers. Um, and basically, we just uh, wanted to make sure that the uh, criteria that we're using for determining when we allow intra-district transfers in the policy matched what uh, we've been doing with procedures. Um, for the most part, they were identical, uh, but there were a little bit of differences in the wording. Um, so if you look at number two there, uh, rather than just saying the sibling of a student accepted as a transfer previously, um, what we're saying in this case is that that should be a sibling is currently enrolled uh, at the requested school. So instead of just saying because you had a student here at some point in time, you're given that priority, the, the reasoning behind that is really we don't want to have families have to have kids in different schools. So really it's, a, it's about having them in the current school. And then number three, being parent of a staff member at the destination school. That, that's, a, that's a change. We hadn't had that previously, but we feel like in the staffing environment that we're in now, we have to recognize that uh, that's uh, something that we probably do need to provide for those staff members that certainly are people that are, are hard to come by and we want to keep. Mr. Hawley. Oh, oh, okay. Sorry. Any so, questions? The last thing there is simply um, kind of changing that date a little bit rather than August 15th, which, you know, is a static date that we wouldn't know how far that was from when the actual time that school started was. Changing that to the first day of school for the current year. So, again, the notifications that we do are all done well before that, but... Uh, that uh, probably makes sense to have that align with the, the start of the school year rather than the August 15th date. Okay, at this time I would entertain a motion to approve 8331. I make a motion to approve policy 8331 transfers within GIPS as presented. Second by Ms. Albers. Discussion? Seeing none, we proceed to a vote. Motion passes. Reports. Grand Island Public Schools Foundation report. Mr. Fisher. Okay. Um, I did have the opportunity to attend the uh, foundation meeting the other day, so. I know these things were all things that they talked about at the, at the meeting, but uh, We'll run through real quick the report that, that was provided. Um, we're in the best season of the year, the scholarship season. Obviously that is an important time for the foundation. Uh, the deadline for the GIPS Foundation online scholarship application was February 7th. Uh, in addition to being user friendly for students and web-based, uh, the web-based data also allows the foundation to receive and perfect scholarship review process. The scholarship process, which involves approximately 100 volunteers, our reviewers do not see the personal data as student applicants are assigned a number, and 
to reviewers start training the last week of February. They would probably still welcome you as a volunteer if uh, you wanted to jump in there and do scholarship reviews. Thanks. The red button. That was very helpful. I got it. I got it right the first time. <laughs> All right. Okay. Um, they're excited to announce the upcoming Legends and Legacies event, which is scheduled to take place on March 12th. This is an event celebrating both 2024 Hall of Honor and legendary educator inductees. You won't want to miss this. Um, again, that date is March 12th. The time is 5.30 um, for social and 6.30 for dinner. And uh, it will be held at the Riverside Golf Club. So again, March 12th. Uh, Hall of Honor honorees will be George Aub, class of 68, Dr. Thomas Medell, class of 67, and Steve Hornady, class of 68. Legendary educa educators would include uh, Yvette Inglehop, Kermit McHugh, and Donald Vanderham. Foundation is also gearing up for the 2024 annual staff and board campaign. We have set some amazing goals for the 2024 campaign. Doug and Cheryl Jensen are our 2024 campaign chairs. Other action items on the Foundation Board's agenda this month include the following 2024 scholarship offers and award plan and also approving the 2024 scholarship reviewers. That concludes the Foundation Report. Thank you, Mr. Fisher. Now we'll move on to item 7.2, the Student Representative tour Report, Hattie Beltran. Um, okay, so I'll start off with athletics. Uh, girls wrestling has been on a roll lately. I don't know if you guys have seen, but they're ranked number one girls dual team by Kabuda. Um, and uh, they were also named the first ever NSWCA state dual invitational champs and where they won 46 to 30 over Pierce. Uh, they have districts tomorrow, and then state will be held, I believe, Thursday, Friday, and Saturday next week. Uh, they also um, introduce some new members to the <coughs> girls' 100-point club. So the following girls have scored over 100 team points for this wrestling season. Uh, Bella Arantz, who's a freshman, and two seniors, Brianna Kuchka and Cladis Lucas. Uh, they also held their senior night, uh, I believe, the last week of January. And um, they sent off eight seniors, four of which who were 2023 state qualifiers. And um, as a group, they have won over 28 tournaments in the last three years and have a dual record of 29 to 0, which is why they're ranked number one. Um, and then as for boys wrestling, they also uh, hosted their last home meet where they sent off their seniors. And they earned third for the NSA, for the NSAA state, duel, uh, state duels in Class A. And then senior Reed Kelly and Justice Holstetler were selected to participate in the 2024 Nebraska Shrine Bowl. And then for girls bowling, they were named the Hack Conference champions and the District A6 champions for uh, which qualified them for the state bowling tournament. And then I just saw today that they were state runner-ups. So congrats to them. Uh, for boys basketball, Coach Slough earned his 100th career win this past weekend. And then for powerlifting, they've had a strong season. And it's coming to an end, but uh, we had six Islanders qualify for powerlifting nationals in April, uh, which will be held in Louisiana. So senior Rayleigh Ostermeyer and then the rest were juniors, uh, Hunter Christensen, Jesse Gutierrez, Matthew Hernandez, Angel Pena, and Giselle Lara. 
and this last weekend, uh, the Gish Cheer and uh, Dance Team hosted their winter camp for elementary students, and they, the students also had a chance to perform at Saturday's basketball game, which is really fun to watch. Um, and then yesterday, uh, some student athletes were able to sign their letters of intent to continue their academic and athletic careers after high school. So we had one girl and five boys, Kiara Jones. Uh, she signed to continue uh, doing track at UNK. Dylan Henricks, baseball at York, Nebraska. Cohen Nelson, baseball at Cloud County Central Community College. Um, and Zach Pittman, wrestling at Southwest Minnesota State University. Edgar Beltran, baseball at William Penn University, and Coben Colson, soccer at Dakota Wesleyan. And then winter sports are coming to an end. So like I said, uh, most um, hack and districts there, um, hack was last week or a couple of weeks ago. District will be this week and then state will be held next week. And that following Monday, February 26th, we'll start spring sports. So I'm really excited uh, because once track season comes, I feel like the school year goes by pretty fast. And then as for activities, uh, Gish Show Choir, they their ultimate image uh, group scored first for having the best band, best vocals, best choreo, and best soloist. Uh, Future Image scored 7th and Sweet Rev scored 9th at the Hastings Tigers Clash Show Choir competition. And then at the GI Northwest Gold Rush uh, competition, uh, Ultimate Image uh, scored 1st, Sweet Rev 2nd, and Future Image 1st. And then as for robotics, they started their season off at the O'Neill Robotics Tournament and they had three students make it to finals. And then Gish Beach held their first home meet last weekend, January 27th. And I was there to volunteer for uh, concessions and they had a lot of schools. It was packed there. and um, But we had a lot of Islanders do well. They had 13 medal in numerous events and um, they had uh, one champion in the varsity program oral interpretation and one in the novice informative speaking event. And they have, they've had a tournament in Aurora with eight medalists and um, a novice oral interpretation of drama ranking champion. And then recently some other news, uh, Coach Ladwig was named the new activities director uh, following the retirement of Miss Wells. And uh, the, induction, the induction of the 2025 uh, National Honor Society will be held on Monday, February 19th at 7 p.m. in the Gish Auditorium. And Ms. Schultz, the NHS supervisor, told me that um, all board members are welcome to attend. So with that, I conclude my report. All right, thank you, Eddie. Item 7.3, Superintendent Report, Mr. Fisher. Okay, Eddie did a nice job of touching on those things that are going on at the high school. I, I did want to extend my congratulations to our bowling team that, uh, you know, did end up second. Um, yesterday, I, they said they got home about 2.30 last night. Um, yeah, this morning, yeah, okay. <laughs> That'd be more right, this morning. Um, but yeah, they... Uh, they won through the you know the rounds and then they and had beat Fremont once and then Fremont came back and beat them twice and unfortunately so we ended up second again this year but uh, you know still a, still a great accomplishment and then again you know the the girls went in the first ever girls state wrestling dual tournament that's um, and I think they're in a great position to to hopefully maybe be able to win the the uh, bracketed tournament that they'll be in next week. Um, they do have their districts. Um, boys district, actually, if you haven't had a chance to get to any wrestling and you want to go take in wrestling, uh, the boys actually are hosting their district here um, 
at Gish on Saturday. Girls wrestle in Broken Bow tomorrow, and then they'll both wrestle Thursday, Friday, Saturday, like Eddie said, next week. Um, Eddie also mentioned Mr. Ladwick moving into the, the AD position. Um, we, we actually have done several hirings in the, the last couple weeks. Um, Mr. Hubbard was here earlier. He is uh, going to be stepping into the, the executive principal role at, at GISH. Um, we had a MTSS coordinator position that was open that uh, Mr. Eckerman, the, the current principal at Bar, is going to be moving over to that position. And then um, we also had uh, an assessment and, and academic um, support position that uh, Opal Bentley, who is the current principal at Conecrum, is going to be moving to. So we got some hiring done, but because we ended up moving people in all of those cases, we now have more hiring to do. So we'll have to fill the positions that they're vacating. And and, and we know we have, have people internally, and, and we would expect some, some good external interest in those positions as well. Um, just Real quick, uh, legislative update. Uh, I did actually go to Lincoln on Tuesday and testify on three bills. Um, I testified in opposition to uh, 1141, which was Senator McKinney's bill, to, to further, um, I guess, last year the, the legislature passed uh, uh, a restriction on suspending and expelling um, preschool through second grade students um, and and then McKinney's bill this year um, would move remove the uh, emergency exclusion clause um, that we actually have have used in a, at least one instance this year we had a, you know a violent situation with a you know a young student that we we really felt like we needed you know, for the protection of other students, the staff and that student is, themselves needed to uh, remove. And so the the McKinney bill would have stripped, you know, would, I guess, we don't know where it's going to end up, but uh, anyhow, would strip that uh, ability to, to have any tool that uh, would allow us to remove a, a student in preschool through second grade. There also were two bills that one of the bills, LB 899, would basically repeal for all class three schools, which we would be, um, uh, that restriction on suspending and expelling those students. And then uh, LB 1146 basically added violent acts as a reason for suspension and uh, expulsion of students in pre-k through second grade so those two bills i testified in favor of and again not that we're interested in suspending young students uh, at any time but there are times that it's it does become necessary and i think obviously rather than having a, a one-size-fits-all mandate i think having the the local school be able to make a determination around what's best for that student what's best for the the other students in the class and what's best for the staff is is probably where that should lie so i did uh testify on those bills um one of the bills that uh was was made aware of um after the hearing had been held i we knew it was there there's been uh, something in the the hopper with option uh for the last several years usually well not usually it hasn't gone anywhere hasn't had any interest at all, but uh, there was a little bit more concern with this one this year. LB 1230 would um, strip away the the payments for option students uh, if the school district lies in the same city, which obviously in our situation, most of our students um, are opting to Northwest, uh, which may or may not lie in the city depending on what the technical uh, because the northwest high school is technically not a part of the city because when the annexing took place all around it they're not able to annex it so whether it would be viewed that way in in terms of this or not but certainly that's something that we would need to be very aware of because 
Obviously, if there was no money that would accompany the students, Northwest is very definitely going to say, we can't accept those students. And so now all of a sudden we've got 700 more students that we're going to have to figure out where we're going to go with. 500 of those being at the high school level. So we're obviously would put us in a bind. So we're, we're definitely going to keep a very close eye. We've shared with a, a number of senators already that uh, if this comes out of committee, that this is something that's not good at all for us. Other than that, you know, just lots of caps and revenues legislation that's going on. Um, and uh, hopefully we'll end up in a position that that isn't detrimental, further detrimental to us when uh, all of the, the, the shakedown gets done. Um, <clears throat> did just want to mention registration um, for, for students is, is open between February 5th and March 31st. So again, if you are in contact with any parents that have students, make sure you encourage them to get those registrations done because when March 31st rolls around, that's when we make a determination on how many sections of each grade we're going to have in our different buildings. And then, you know, basically once those sections are full, we can no longer accept students in those buildings. So even though that building might be across the street from you, if it's full, it's full. And we'll have to you know, send those students to a different building. So, again, that's it. It is important to get those registrations done by March 31st. Last thing I wanted to mention, you know, in case you're really bored tomorrow morning, you can come watch the state of the school, state of the uh, the city. Um, I get to speak tomorrow. I, I'm feeling much more confident this year that I have uh, some grasp of uh, what's going on in the uh, school that I can share with uh, people than I had last year when I did this. But uh, it uh, now I think we've, you know. Obviously, we're going to share information about our financial position, what's going on with that. That's obviously probably the, when we think about our state, that's a key point. But we also have some good, you know, assessment data to share and some other things that uh, should have a, you know, a fantastic report that I will present to the city tomorrow. So if you're bored at 830 tomorrow, come watch it. It'll be exciting. That's my report. Thank you, Mr. Fisher. Ms. Albers. I'll be brief because I know everybody wants to get out of here, but just a couple things um, legislatively that I wanted to add. So uh, Senator Hughes' bill of, um, about the class three schools to be able to expel students between K through two, you're probably wondering why she brought just class three, uh, Lincoln and Omaha are four and five schools. So uh, that is, those are the districts that she represents, and that was one of the biggest complaints that they had is, is about um, their inability to be able to uh, suspend students when they absolutely had to. Like Mr. Fisher said, nobody wants to suspend a K through two um, student, but if you have to, you have to. And so she's bringing that, and we just happen to be encompassed in that bill, so that is something that we, we weren't in favor of. Um, and then as far as the option enrollment goes, uh, Senator Wayne from Omaha brings an option enrollment bill uh, continually every year. <clears throat> I don't know how many years he's done it, but he does it about every year. And this, uh, we're just some unintentional collateral with this bill uh, because it's actually more for the Omaha schools, particularly probably more through uh, OPS and Westside. Uh, but we, um, but we're still going to, we still had to testify um, against that because that would be a huge issue for us. Then on um, another note, on Monday, LB 1050, which is the period poverty bill, is going to be heard in the Education Committee, and um, I will be there testifying in favor. So uh, if any of you would like to make an online comment, you can um, send your letters in through the unicameral website, and I encourage everyone to speak in favor of uh, LB 1050, and uh, that's it. Thank you, Ms. Silvers. Okay. Notification of upcoming board meetings. Regular Board of Education meeting will next will